Thank you very much, Michael. And um, thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to see so many of you here. Um, a bit about myself. Um, I'm a curator, as Michael has suggested, and I work in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, and I sit in a quite recently established department called Design, Architecture and Digital. Now, we've been in post three years, which in kind of Silicon Valley terms is quite a long time. But in museum terms, in an institution that has over 160 years history, we are still very new. We're just scratching the surface. Um, it's my first time in Stamford, and I'm really happy to be able to share some of the work that we are doing with you. Um, so when I sent my abstract over, I listed a series of objects that I, as a curator, have sought to acquire. Now, they include the Lego Research Institute, which is the first in the Danish company's history to feature women in a professional context targeted at girls, um, the world's first 3D printed firearm, a liberator, so termed and called by its creator, Cody Wilson, who at the time was a Texan law student, or oh, he's still Texan, but he was a law student at the time, um, and Flappy Bird, which again, took a long time to get into the museum to the extent that we had to translate a letter into Chinese, then Vietnamese, via three friends of mine. Um, it made headlines as one of the most um, frustrating games, and the anger that it brought about was very much what led to it being removed from the app and Google Play stores. Um, for me, as a curator, to find a way to display that in the museum led to my trying to find the best player in an institution made up of curators. Um, our apprentice electrician was sure to be the one to be able to do it. Six points was what he could manage. Um, this is a set of Christian Louboutin shoes in five ethnically diverse shades of nude. Note the word. Some broken umbrellas from Hong Kong. Mon Mon, which is a WeChat-enabled soft toy marketed at parents living away from home, Chinese parents predominantly. Um, and the other objects that I added to that list were the ones that have proved elusive. A set of broken computer parts um, that at one time held a copy of the NSA and other files leaked by Edward Snowden, and the infamous VW defeat device. Um, how do I go about collecting that? What is it? We'll come on to that. Um, I think at this point, it would be a very reasonable question for one of you to say, what are you doing? Um, what do these modest, sometimes modest, very diverse objects have in common? And what place do they have in a museum? Um, and in this case, the world's first design museum, the Victoria and Albert. How many of you actually have been there? Oh, so quite a few, great. Um, those of you who haven't, we are an institution known for its grand galleries and collections of decorative arts and design, but also its blockbuster exhibitions of David Bowie or Alexander McQueen. Um, but I think all that said, we do have a much, much more radical past. And this is important in the work that I do, but also the work that my team does. Um, the frieze that you see here kind of encapsulates that radical moment. Um, this is the museum's original front entrance, and it's our founding. Um, despite the UK or Great Britain, depending how you want to term it, depending on your loyalties in terms of the royals, um, is the birth, despite us being the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, at the point in the 1850s, the UK was being outdone or flogged, if you want to use those terms, in terms of industrial design by the French, the Germans, the Americans, you name it, everybody else was appearing to do it better. Um, Prince Albert therefore organized what was the world's first great exhibition or the world's first expo in 1851. And this was a means to address this seeming incapacity in design quality and design terms in the UK. Um, so here you can see Queen Victoria standing in, here we go, our great monarch, um, standing in front of what is Joseph Paxton's Crystal Palace. So the black outline is the great glass um, palace in which this exhibition was hosted. Um, and she's seen receiving the nations bringing their best art, science, and design. Um, this exhibition was such a success that the museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum, was its result. We are also part of Albertopolis, which includes the Royal Colleges of Art, Music, and Dance, 
science, but also the other larger London institutions, the Natural History Museum and the Science Museum. Um, so 1851 was when we were founded, and it was with a mission for contemporary design to collect it as an educational resource for manufacturers, designers, and the public. And in museum terms, that's quite important, because at this point, museums were not necessarily for the every person. Um, Henry Cole, who was our very charismatic first director, put it more succinctly. It was to be the powerful antidote to the gin palace. So rather than going drinking in the evenings, you might find yourself taking advantage of an institution that has the first to be a place of learning for all. Um, and that meant having gas lighting, extended opening hours, and indeed a cafe where you could sustain yourself prior to having a look and improving your lot. Um, the V&A's foundation, I think you can term it in the, as a place to help navigate the anxieties of what was brought about by industrialization. So it's an output or an outcome of the industrial age. Um, and this, this usefulness, this radicality, is something that I and my colleagues in the design, architecture, and digital department are very much motivated by. So since being in post in early 2013, we have, as a team of curators, been tasked with looking at the designed world afresh, and rapid response collecting was our first act of this kind of radicality, if you want to put it in those terms. It's a new strand to the museum's wider collecting activities. We are an institution with 3.5 million plus objects, some of which are more than 7,000 years old. So you have to understand that rapid response is one of its activities. Um, as the name suggests, it's simply about getting the thing itself into the museum quickly. Um, this may seem obvious, but museums, as I've already in some ways suggested, do move quite slowly. But it's also about thinking what the museum is for and what public institutions do in wider civic infrastructure, but also in the world in which we live and learn. Um, all the objects that we acquire, to our mind, are objects that are part of public discourse. And um, by bringing the object itself into the museum, and it is at this point in time so often a physical object, but not only. And I think every object that I'm talking about today is a digital object, but we can come on to that in the questions and conversation afterwards. Um, so we think we can deepen understanding by showing the thing itself. Um, but at this point, I'd like you to understand that it's quite a modest project, Rapid Response. There are five showcases and 12 objects on display at any one time. Um, and when we got our gallery, we were delighted. We have about eight miles of galleries in the museum, and our space is one that leads to another, but it was our own. Um, it's quite a modest budget, which meant lining a set of cases in metal and buying a printer to print our own magnetic labels. Um, this means that we can get objects on display in days or weeks instead of months or years, or well, that is the ambition. So Rapid Response opened to the public in July 2014, and um, the response has ranged from the indifferent um, to the outraged um, to the sensational. Of course, I like this one most. Um, but ultimately, Rapid Response is about placing questions of our relationships to new objects and new technologies in the public realm. Um, so let's come on to a number of the objects that we've acquired. And I start with the firearm because it's already featured in a number of the slides that we've been looking at. So on the 5th of May 2013, Cody successfully fired the first entirely 3D printed firearm. Um, Many footage. thought this couldn't be done. A moment to celebrate for its maker. But could this plastic firearm have grave implications for gun control around the world? Um, so there is the question. Uh, it was released online for free, this 3D file, um, and the State Department had forced or requested that Cody take it down within days, and it was very available on Pirate Bay. Um, how we source our objects is one question that we might come to. But then within, within weeks, we sent one of our colleagues off to see Cody in his studio um, to secure objects for the museum. And I think while I'm talking about it, 
think about this object in digital terms. It's of interest because it is a multiple and that you can create it at the press of the button. But here we are as museum curators flying across the pond to try and get the physical thing. That said, we secured the object with Cody. Um, and it was really one of our very first acts of rapid response collecting. Um, and frustratingly, it was not so rapid in the end um, because it took more than a year to get the object into the UK and on display in the museum. So here you have it being shipped as fine art and arriving in October 2014. Um, the reason for this was that the export of this firearm necessitated a change in US law because a plastic firearm fell without the legal frameworks of governance at the time of export. Um, and I think if you think about these objects in those terms, that is absolutely part and parcel of its interest for us and in the wider context. Um, we as curators immediately thought that this was a fundamentally important piece of contemporary design history. Um, in having that physical thing in the museum, we can both show its design brilliance in terms of it being a fantastically engineered piece of work, but also it's absolute and immediate failure. Fire it three times and it breaks. If you want a proper gun, there are other ways to go about it. For Cody, this was a political act. Um, for us, in terms of rapid response, it's an object that has forever changed our understanding of distributed manufacturing. It's about regulation and the law and new, te new technologies and how they have broad ramifications. Um, it was one that blew the techno-utopianism around 3D printing out of the water. And I think we are still experiencing the consequences of this. And I don't think that's an overstatement for this object. Um, rapid response objects as a whole are important and interesting to us because they are material evidence, physical evidence at the moment, um, of social, political, economic, and technical change. Um, they are newsworthy, and I think that's part of what rapid response's success has been generated by, but they are much more so about showing advances in design, but also objects that can reveal truths about how we live together today. Um, another one of the objects that um, I'd like to consider as a digital object, but also to focus in on, is a set of two painted umbrellas. So sitting in London, we, or I in particular, observed the um, political disquiet in Hong Kong in late September 2014. Um, I'm sure that most of you or many of you are aware that tear gas was used to um, counteract citizens of Hong Kong in the streets protesting for what they consider to be democratic law. Um, they very rapidly became known as, or this set of, this protest became known as the Umbrella Revolution. And um, for us, this was again a functional object. We are a design institution, and every object that we acquire, first and foremost, has to be something of design. But here we have a functional object that has taken on political meaning. Um, we asked a local academic and contact of ours to help us find an umbrella. Um, at the time, King sent us images of tents, tote bags, and other objects or accoutrements, accessories, that had been made from recycled umbrellas. Um, but we were firm in our um, desire for an object um, that was useful. And it was a useful object that had been invested um, with a deeper meaning. It became a shield from tear gas as well as from rain. Um, so we sourced two of the painted umbrellas. There were very many painted umbrellas, but we managed to find two um, located, or we, I say king, managed to find them for us, um, painted umbrellas at this recycling point that was run by students who were very, very prominent within these protests at the Occupy Admiralty site. Um, and I rather like that picture because it really brings home the object that we now have in the collection. Um, I should say they were painted with the symbol Kang, which means to support, to protect, or to persevere. But um, King, on once having collected these objects, he started to look at them a little bit more closely. And he's an inquisitive individual, very much interested in popular culture, and has an anthropological bent. So if you notice, you'll see a small screen-printed guy holding an umbrella aloft. And for King, this was a lead. Um, and a number of days later, I received an email from Feng Wai Yin, 
um, a young advertising executive. And I'm just going to read a quote from the email. The umbrella revolution started on a Sunday afternoon. We were shocked by the tear gas, but the citizens were so angry. They were not frightened, and more and more people rushed to the street. The next morning, I brainstormed with my friends. We wanted to do something to gain more support. We saw the term umbrella revolution created by the foreign press to try and name this protest movement. We decided to design and produce umbrellas and shoot a short video asking people from different countries to hold an umbrella to support us. Our objective was to gain more international support, hoping that, in many, that it may put more pressure on the government. Um, so Yin and 20 of his friends and colleagues collected as many umbrellas as they could from local retailers, turned out around 500 and painted and printed them by hand. Um, by Tuesday, so within days, um, they were ready to shoot the video. Um, and with the help of those in Causeway Bay, they filmed the umbrellas being held aloft um, to the shout of true universal suffrage. Point, just to come back to Yin and what he thought, and I focus quite a lot on. Ooh, hang on, that, um, to come back to Yin and his email, I focus quite a lot on his correspondence because for me this is an integral part of the object and our understanding of it. Um, and so he remembers it vividly. This point after the video was shot, it was a very emotional moment. It started to rain. We left all the umbrellas at the supply centre run by the students at Admiralty. All of the people involved in the project, including the van driver, refused to take any money. I felt very grateful to everyone. And of course, this is the point where King finds them at the recycling point. Um, for me as a curator, I wanted those umbrellas in the museum. That they then had this international dimension, this lens, this virtual... I mean, the, the fact that the umbrellas had become symbolic via a distributed media network was absolutely clear, but then that we happened by chance to come across these objects where Yin had very much with intention created something that was for the kind of viral video or the viral press or media circus was um, super interesting. And again, it's about these objects. Often museums get told that objects, once they're in the collection, they die and you arrest their life. But I'd like to think that there are curatorial strategies and approaches that remove that I would say antiquated approach, but these are some of those examples. And I think one of the questions might be is, are these digital objects more likely, more prone to have this afterlife post-entry into the collection? Um, the other thing about this umbrella is it's now in Sydney um, in an exhibition of, that looks at objects and their role in bringing about social and political change. Um, it's a modest thing, and actually one of them is really quite broken. But for me, these are objects that tell us about local politics and citizen action, but also about the freer flows of information, how stories are made and constructed, um, and what the internet or our network society has or enables. I noticed that quite a few of you are working on drones, so this feels like a, a good time to be here because this is our most recent acquisition. <laughs> Do any of you recognize it? Um, so this is... Uh, Europe's biggest Kickstarter project. Um, it had 12,000 backers um, and funded to the figure of 
US dollars, 3.5 million US dollars. So this was 20 times um, its original goal. It's the Zeno micro drone. Um, it was launched in November last year, no, sorry, 2014, in North Wales, so in the UK. Um, Self-taught engineer with a mission to build a marketable, intelligent, autonomous drone. It was a Kickstarter sensation, as they are increasing in number. Um, but the project quite soon ran into trouble. On the 18th of November of last year, the company Talking Group had gone into voluntary liquidation, um, with millions of pounds spent and very, very few drones shipped. So now Zeno was not only Europe's largest Kickstarter project, but the crowdfunding platform's most spectacular blowout to date. Um, Kickstarter commissioned the investigative journalist Mark Harris to establish what went wrong, um, which I think, in their terms, was a very enlightened thing to do. And it's also where I came to become, get much, much more interested in this story. He wrote 13,000 words, and within those 13,000 words, he concludes um, that it was a more of a foul up than foul play. So the fact that this never happened wasn't because they were embezzling funds, but because they couldn't meet the demand of this wildly successful crowdfunding campaign. Um, the founder of the company just did not have the experience to mass produce objects of this number. Um, I think one of the things that is important with the Zeno story is the complicity of the media. So. This object uh, went on to be named as a top object, best design at CES in 2015. It had never flown, and it did not fly once at CES. Any of you who have been to CES will be very aware that there are many, many drones that do fly. And I think um, one of the broader questions around this and why this object is interesting and important to me is this want believe of the digital. We are not yet tooled up to be as critical as we might be of these types of projects and objects. Um, is that what the role of the museum is? Perhaps. Um, so very, very few of them actually shipped, and I'm quite delighted that this sitting next to our vendor's toaster is our latest acquisition. Um, it, this is an object that in the museum enables us to look at crowd crowdfunding in the round. Um, it sits alongside the Oculus Rifts and the Pebble Watches, um, which, of course, as you will know, are the great successes. Um, Kickstarter's aim and pro purpose is to um, bring creativity to life. Um, and this direct digital connection between maker and the community or the consumer is something that is changing design practice, but also the retail or the purchase experience. And I think this is something that we are at the advent of, and we need to be able to look at and take seriously. This is an object that, through material evidence, enables to, us to do so. Um, Yancy Strickler, who is one of the co-founders of Kickstarter, brilliantly wrote in or replied to the journalist Mark Harris. Um, so the journalist took his findings to Kickstarter, and it's interesting to read in the article how Kickstarter responds or how open they are to some of his findings. And um, to me, one of the most memorable quotes is from Yancey. If you want 100% success with hardware and new products, I think the only solution is that you just shop on Amazon. Um, and already that the suggestion is Amazon is um, a marker in time. Um, so I noticed that one of you was working on this idea of failure and the creative outputs and outcomes of failure. And um, we want to acquire those. I think museums, particularly design museums, are very much prone to acquiring or looking at the great successes of the named designer. But I think failures, such as this drone, but also the sinister, as you might consider the liberator, are as important because these outliers um, are as important as conventional design successes because these outliers are often the things that help us to think most, most clearly about how we interact today. Um, and it's also not necessarily the kind of insight and approach to those objects that we are taking is not necessarily the intent of the designer or the manufacturer. And I think museums, more generally also, and when we talk about design, architecture, 
the making process. It's not about or solely about the intent of those who make things. Um, and I'm looking at you as all who are, I think, on the making side of this. Um, so the intent of the manufacturer or the designer and how we might look at that. So um, here we have the VW defeat device. Now, this is something that is to date proved elusive to me in terms of acquiring it for the collection. But I think this is a digital object. Again, it absolutely is. But what do we think it is? It speaks to our changing relationships to machines and engineering, um, our use of cars, and our care or concern for the environment. These are huge abstract questions but that all impact on each one and every one of us um, every day. I've been speaking about the rain a great deal in a British fashion over the last number of hours, but I think the rain here in California is one of those things that we can relate back to an object such as this. Um, but how do we work out what the VW defeat device is? I'm not the only one. I'm by no means the most expert person trying to work that out. But in terms of museums and collecting, what is it that we should collect? Is it the car, the engine, the line of code, or the trunk-mounted equipment used to carry out the emissions test, which firmly established that the defeat device was a thing? Um, the question that's at the heart of this deceit um, is what is it? Because that's exactly why VW or the scam was possible. Um, I certainly, but I think very many of us, have absolutely no idea of what we're looking at when we open up the bonnet of a car. And so for me, this object and its appearance and its um, occurrence in 2015-16 is about our changing relationship to cars, manufacturing, but also that we are at a point in shift. Cars are becoming more generic. Um, we will be seeing different types of cars going forward. And these are the types of objects that when we look at trying to corral design history that can tell us a great deal today, but also in museum terms, we're responsible for these objects in the here and now, but also for their understanding and thinking about their understanding in the future. So if it is a line of code, what might we do to collect that? But in display terms, is that the most interesting thing that we acquire? And if it's not, what else do we acquire around the object to capture that social and interactive or haptic experience of the object? Um, I like the idea of bringing a car into the museum. I have, I've written to a number of people to try and get an object of this um, description into the collection, but my most promising lead is going to the local VW dealership, where the recall is dealing with actually sw swapping those objects in and out. Um, whether that's the most meaningful thing to acquire is something I'm not yet sure of, and I would also ask you to think about. Um, but you will see that it's a great deal about legwork, and um, I guess there is an investigative lens to what we are doing through rapid response. And I think that's, that's not surprising in the sense that it's about going beyond the laudatory. Um, another, or the last of the elusive objects that I will talk about today. Um, so here we have the front page of the Guardian newspaper on the 20th of August 2013. And you'll see there's a small article, or a small um, flashpoint at the bottom of the page, which um, talks about a set of computers being destroyed at the hands of the US, uh, sorry, the UK intelligence agencies. So this, after this story was run, um, I immediately wrote to the Guardian editor to say, can we have those broken computers? And he was like, yes, sure, they're broken. Um, but then things got complicated. Um, so these are computers that the Guardian used to store and work on the sets of files that were leaked by Edward Snowden. Um, and the Guardian by no means had the only copy of these documents, but these were the London copy. Or, well, this computer or set of computers held the London copy. And I wrote to um, Russ Bridger because for me it was immediately obvious that these were very, very powerfully communicative objects about the struggle for control over the digital realm. Um, the world in which we live and the data that we inevitably give forth from ourselves on a daily basis. Um, at, the, um, at the Victoria and Albert Museum, uh, 
I, I was quite new in the museum at the time, and only afterwards did I say, I've just written to get these computers into the collection. Um, and it caused quite a lot of discussion. Once the editor had said yes, at The Guardian, it was about actually establishing if they could guarantee the legal status of the object. Um, because it became ever more complicated. Even though these were destroyed computers, they were still ones that had held um, privileged information. Uh, so they were thinking about whether they could give them to us. But as interestingly for me, um, my colleagues and my senior colleagues did force quite a discussion about why they were relevant to the institution. And so the conversation became about the purpose of the museum, which is something that I will return to. Um, so, our government, the UK government, wanted these computers. They understood them to be rightfully theirs because they held information that had been taken without permission. Um, the Guardian said, absolutely not, they are ours. And so they arrived after quite considerable discussion um, and the threat of closure of the newspaper at a compromise whereby these computers were destroyed. And this is a short video that's slightly later, but it does give you some idea there's no sound. Um, it's harder to break up a, smash up a computer than you might think. The paper, which had other copies of the Snowden files overseas, agreed to take an angle grinder to the computer while the intelligence agents watched. And for me, it's... I mean, I see some of you smiling and there's a, a level of disbelief. But I find it totally amazing that there is an idea that the destruction of these computers is in any way meaningful. Um, the Guardian journal uh, editor um, himself said it was a pointless act of symbolism um, because it was clear that there were multiple copies of these computers, uh, these files across the globe. Um, and the Guardian was certainly going to continue to report on the story. And this is the point at which the Guardian linked up with the New York Times because the way the press works here is in a freer means than we have in the UK. Um, so here we are. This is the MacBook Air that uh, was subject to such brute force. Um, we've spoken a little bit about their actual existence. And um, for the V&A, so it was also, it was, why were these objects relevant to the museum? Rapid response collecting at this point in time was very new. Um, yes, at the museum, we had the support for our activity, but we're a big institution. We have 120 curators, and uh, there are different types of committees and lobby groups that you have to go through to get your activities endorsed. So yes, we were acting on the authority of the institution, but this was very much an act of collecting that put the question of the museum at its heart. Um, why was this a piece of contemporary design that was relevant? It was totally broken. That was the view. Um, the newsworthiness was also a problem. Of course, the V&A is a public national institution. Would we, in some ways, be considered to be upsetting our paymasters? I, as a new curator at the time, had not necessarily considered these wider ramifications as much as I should. And I actually think that's a good thing, um, because I don't um, feel that those concerns were relevant in this case. So maybe this is the question itself. But is, in this case, is the designed object the computer or the design, like the, the design destruction of it? Well, I think both. I mean, in terms of objects in the museum, we always look for provenance. And provenance is why this particular object is interesting. So the act of its destruction is what makes this particular example interesting. But um, had we been able to acquire this into the collection, I said that this was elusive, we would certainly have acquired a MacBook Air of the same generation to sit alongside. Um, the act of its destruction is what makes it interesting. And you could say that was its process of design. And it was very amusing, but also fascinating to watch the IT specialists from The Guardian come in and see their work sit alongside what, in a context, where you do still understand objects to be examples of great designers. So it's, it's a fluid answer, and I don't think there needs to be a singular one. Um, 
But just to come back to whether we could acquire it on the basis of my colleagues, um, it was the insight and expertise of a medieval sculpture colleague um, that led to one of our most um, convincing lines of justification. We are a museum rich with objects that have been subject to damage. This is a limestone British altarpiece from the 14th century where the heads of each of the saints was knocked off in the 16th century as a result of the Reformation or image breaking in those terms when there was a shift in bias in the church. So here we have, and I think they're quite beautiful, um, but again, I've just said as a curator, I'm trying to move away from this idea of connoisseurship and the kind of primacy of the aesthetic. Um, so we had our historical precedent um, that these objects, because they were destroyed, um, were communicative about the new realities of the digital age. Um, it still took us two years from my first email. Not so rapid, I would say again. Um, I'm going to try and go back to get these objects into the museum. So this Guardian computer, I mean, we actually, these Guardian computers, I should say, we also had a Western digital hard drive alongside the MacBook Air. So one was a solid state hard drive and one was a platter drive. Again, changing technologies and another lens through which to look at these objects. So curatorially, in terms of rapid response, these computers were both our greatest success to date, but also our greatest failure. Um, so the Guardian decided to keep them for themselves in the end, um, which was a great, I have to say, disappointment, but also a recognition of the power of the object to tell stories and their acknowledgement of that. We were able to exhibit them in a display called Ways to be Secret, which formed part of a larger exhibition that my colleagues and I curated last year called All of This Belongs to You. All of This Belongs to You was an exhibition about the role of museums in 21st century civic life, but also how design and architecture inform and impact on our lives as citizens. Um, it was also this question of what our obligation is as a public institution to further or enhance or be involved in public discourse. And I think for some, the idea that the museum is an active agent within these contemporary or political issues is quite a stretch. We have a museum that was founded on those principles and a group of curators who are quite keen in bringing some of that back. Um, so ways to be secret, as you can just see a few of the objects here, brought around the Guardian computers as, together a set of objects that tried to bring to the front of our visitors' minds what's at stake um, in our digital network lives. So you went from the selfie stick through to the Guardian computers and a set of military-grade mobile phones that are, from what we understand, um, the most secure on the market to date. All of these objects have entered into the collection, and so you can say that within the collections of the v &A, this moment of realisation of questions of privacy, data ownership, a right to freedom of expression are marked within our collections. Um, at the time of the opening, the editor of The Guardian very much acknowledged that having the objects on display in a public national civic institution was important. Um, and his views were, I think this is a message of hope. It allows for a continuation of what was a necessary debate, a debate that had to be had, because this is our data. The data belongs to us. Um, and these continue to be really important questions um, for design, the digital, but also you and I using our mobile phones and in some ways having them as the extension of ourselves. Um, who owns our data, web privacy, are questions that we cannot escape today. And I would argue that they become much more real for those of us who are less familiar with the subject. When you see an object such as a MacBook Air, something that we very regularly use to conduct our daily lives, um, having been subject to such extreme force. Um, one of the things that for me became particularly interesting with these objects and working with a group called Privacy International is that you see that every element of the computer had some form of um, action on it. So even the heat sink and the fan. And so our, I mean, this is a slight aside, but our intelligence agency, the British intelligence agencies, but I think you could make that 
a broader take. Very rarely leave evidence of their actions, but because of the insistence of the Guardian that these objects were not to be given over and not to be fully destroyed, we now have a set of parts that can be used forensically to track back, to think about, is there something being stored on other parts of our computers? Um, it's a quite technical field, but one that has been begun to be researched via these parts. So again, it's that long tail of objects and the material thing. Um, the thing about this computer is also, it was about rapid response having a impact on the wider activity of the institution. So this was a display, an act of collecting, more broadly, so in effect product design, with a lens towards security and surveillance that was made possible through this first approach to the computer. Um, so just to think about rapid response in that broader context, it's something that, I mean, as I said, it's 12 objects at any one time in five showcases. So it's quite a modest thing, but we've been extremely um, privileged in, and honoured, I think, is maybe the better word, in the level of interest it has generated. Um, I think in part it's because it's reinforced the great power of the material thing um, to tell political and social stories. Um, even material things when it pertains to the digital. That is a very museum-based approach, and I think it's one that we will shift from, but it has proved useful to date. I mean, just to come back to Flappy Bird, yes, we have acquired the API files, but we also have two mobile phones that were very common examples of what the game was played on that we also have in the collection. But we cannot guarantee that those phones will work forever, but we do have a, an engagement and a responsibility to make sure that Flappy Bird in some form will be playable into the future. Um, museums are uniquely placed. Much of what we, and again, that sounds, as a curator to say that is to sound like I am not cognizant of the kind of wider world, but as we do live in a very networked and digital age, or increasingly so, we are ever more being told that museums are seen as places of trust, places of fact, and places of authority. It's almost as though, because we are a bit slower, or we are working with real things, that people seem to trust us more. Of course, I like to think that that is true, because it helps me in what I do. Um, and so it's not to say that I buy that wholesale, but I think it's an interesting lens and context within which to think of rapid response collecting. Um, what we do, here you can see how we exhibit the objects. Um, what we do is include a short text about why the object is important at this point in time, as in the point of interest. So with Flappy Bird, it would have been the moment in time when it was removed from purchase. Um, but it's also to say, what is it? It's, they're all nodes in these much bigger, more complex systems. And we try and signal that within the 150 words. But rapid response is at no point trying to tell you what to think about globalization or the aggregation of data. It's a fact-based approach which offers our visitors a set of entry points into these larger um, debates. Um, it's where we hope that our visitors' imaginations take flight. Um, and one of the, I mean, now that we've been doing rapid response for two, two and a bit years, and it is ongoing, now that we have started it, we have a responsibility for it to continue. One of the challenges to think about is how digital is it? So many of the objects now that we've collected 20, 20 something, you begin to think, oh, there's a digital lens to that. Is that because I'm always researching on the internet? Is it because all objects are digital? But one of the great challenges to us is not to just repeat cultural mores. Um, it would be very easy to have the kind of tumbler in the museum sector. And that's absolutely not our goal or ambition. Um, going forward, it is to ask the question of what is our role as cultural producers. And I would also task you with thinking, what is my role in what I do? Um, how can we distill information? And as active listeners or active makers, offer up the tools for our publics or our users um, to decide if and when redress should begin? Um, and how does that fit with the role of the museum as a public institution? Should we be there to try and be an agent of change and activate, activate redress? And I think my view would be yes, but I'm only one curator of many within our institution. 
The V&A was founded in response to the anxieties brought about by the industrial age. And I think much of the work that we are doing with rapid response, but also with our forthcoming exhibitions about the future of design, which will include this quite incredible Facebook drone, which will bring the internet to areas where infrastructure is not yet in place, solar charged. It's an amazing object and actually being made in the UK. So bringing these objects into the museum, into a civic space to offer them up for discussion. Um, so the V&A industrial ang age anxieties, we are also building a new museum in East London, which will be significant in size. And you might say this is one, or our mothership in South Kensington, but also the new institution. And in all of our activities, we are working to serve up the tools, the means of thinking about how we act and operate within the world today. Um, it's about thinking about the network digitized world and our role within it. What is our agency? I think often we think that we are just passive consumers, but consumers are not passive. And I think that is what we as an institution and a museum and a public space can make hay with or bring into discussion. It's that radical zeal of our foundation which we're using as the legs on which to pedal this idea. It's about going beyond the novel or the beautiful to think about objects in the round. Um, the title of our exhibition, All of This Belongs to You, was a very knowing choice. We hold objects in public trust. The same is the case in the US. When you go to a museum, those objects are yours. What should those institutions be doing with them? That is the challenge today. Um, it's a call to arms in some ways as well on my part, because I think we make things, we use things, but what does that mean? It's always that question of bringing about more thoughtful consumers, but also more thoughtful designers. Um, we shape the world and the world shapes us. We need to be active in that engagement. Um, that's me done in terms of talking. Um, I'm aware that some of the questions around actual collecting, archiving, digitizing might be some of the things that you may have questions around. Um, but yes, please do ask um, questions if you have them. I think we have three minutes. We do have a few minutes for comment questions. Question about the, um, <coughs> you mentioned the, the flappy bird and the phone that might not work. Yes. And it seems like it's the, the crude reality of lots of the technology nowadays is that it dies very quickly, it's very fragile, not like, you know, the Roman statues that have been living for, like, centuries. How do you preserve this fragile, or, or maybe you should not preserve it, maybe it's about just recounting the death of technology as more as an expression of the... the There's fact. absolutely the questions that um, feature in my... Well, you might argue that the museum already is a cemetery of those things. We have product design in our collections, and I don't mean that exclusively to the V&A, but we have product design from the 1900s through to today that has never been used. In some way, it's box fresh. Um, it's in some ways never been alive, you might argue. Um, the v &A in, since ha has had this process in place, and that's not one that my colleagues and I have yet sought to change, but we always acquire two objects that you can switch on. So we have one that remains never used and one that you can interact with as a visitor if you were to ask to have a go. Um, and that's the future proofing of objects with an interface at the moment. By no means is that appropriate or long lasting. I think this question of what we are obliged to reserve, uh, preserve um, is one that is ever changing. And the fact that the obsolescence of objects is ever increasing is the greatest concern for us institutionally. How we go about that is a, a, a vast, vast question. And it's about the thinking about what we acquire in terms of the actual object itself, how we acquire around the object to make sure that we have the social, political, economic context around the object. So with Flappy Bird, you might say, it's about having documentary evidence of the frustrations. It's about the death threats that were happening to Dong Nguyen, the designer. It's about 
flushing out that entirety of the story, making sure that the object is playable in some form. I would like to think that we can always have it on a piece of hardware that is in period time with the design of the game, but I, I have to acknowledge that that is very unlikely to be possible. I mean, museums, in terms of digitization of their collections, are quite far advanced. In terms of preserving and storing digital things, we are still very much catching up. At the V&A, we are still working without a digital conservator or a media technologist, which I think is quite... I mean, it is something that will absolutely change in the next number of years. Um, emulation is the way that most institutions are going forward. But it's always a different experience, the one that you had at the first point. And is it then that we begin to collect around that experience to make sure that that... But museums also have to be... Do we collect more objects and less of the singular object? Or do we now start to collect so vastly around every object that we acquire that we are less able to take a broad spectrum? Um, and those are resource questions which frustratingly do impact on how we work and operate. Uh, thanks, fascinating talk. I'm curious how do you time the initiation of acquisition? Because if it's too early, then maybe the context have not been set up yet. But if it's too late, it may not become relevant. And you cannot know that beforehand. And so, with that good response, that's a very particular question. Um, in other terms of collecting, it's never quite so um, critical. So, how we go about knowing what we want to acquire for rapid response is either very reactive, as in we read an article in the newspaper, or we see that Zeno has just plummeted, um, or it's about saying, I know that graphene is this incredible new material. I don't want to acquire it in what it is, because that is maybe more what the Science Museum might do, but I do know that they are working extremely hard to make commercial products. And so I've been following the graphene story very closely, and I know that a light bulb is probably going to be the first product. That will be the point of time when I think we will acquire it. What we acquire and how we acquire is always both about the design process, the object, and then its kind of market or social political impact. Um, there are objects where I think we've missed the boat in terms of rapid response, where I don't think we can include them which is a very kind of fluid and vague sense. Um, but it is the case. We've now been asked and challenged to think back, how might you do this idea of rapid response collecting with the long tail of history? So an example that I always come back to there is the Afghan war rugs, where you start seeing rugs being made with weaponry and tanks. That would be a brilliant rapid response object at the time. Do we acquire that on those terms now? We're not at the moment. That doesn't mean we won't. Um, the context is always there. The thing with rapid response is it's that moment in time and getting it into the museum in some way within touch of that. Many of these objects, and actually all of these objects, have to have a meaning in the museum and in the collection beyond rapid response because they are designed things. It's not that this is an activity of collecting material culture, which I think would slightly change the dynamic. So I'm curious about what rapid response's point of view would be on something that is entirely digital. You know, a good example is one of my colleagues here in computer science, his name is Keith Winston, created a six-line algorithm that was one of the first to essentially decrypt DVDs back in the days when we like sort of brought the motion picture industry to its knees. And you know, by distributing this sort of almost obfuscated code, you could then you know play any DVD and rip it to your hard drive and so on. And so this thing had cultural significance. It's sort of brief. And then it, it, there was there were there was even you know, is it is it at the point where the thing crosses over into the physical world? Like they made a tie with the code on it. And that thing, that tie was auctioned for I think twenty five thousand dollars last year or something like this. I'm wondering, like, where where is this line for your group? Yes, I mean, it, it's it's one that we don't have an answer to yet, and I think we need to be comfortable with that. Again, also because I don't think there is one answer. Um, objects that are solely digital, I mean, code. Yes, absolutely, we should and will be collecting it. But I think we have to think of these objects and how we exhibit them. Um, and we just need to get better at exhibiting things that are 
solely digital. Um, in WeChat is this social media platform which we are now beginning to acquire. Um, we have Monmon, Mon, which is a soft toy, was a sticker. Um, we will be collecting the stickers alongside the actual code of that platform. But there's no way that we can collect it in its entirety, just in terms of the digital designed piece, but also the user interaction and the apps within the app that are being designed by others. We always have to draw a line. But we need to have these things in the collection now and at the same time become more sophisticated in, in the way that we exhibit them. Um, I think if we hold fire until we know how, we will have missed the boat. This question about the tie. Um, we, the number of objects we acquire and the number of objects we discuss is very, very different. And um, when we first started with rapid response, it was so often, oh yes, there's a great story. We now need to find the object. And it never works because we're about material things, but also designed things. So for example, I mean, this is again a very UK based example, but we had a referendum for Scottish independence. And it was like, we must find an object around this. We even put a, um, had a news story run in the major Scottish papers. Um, and we were offered up um, a blackboard that was used to write the numbers of yes and no cupcakes sold in the 90 days prior to the referendum. Interesting and a brilliant example of how you might think about a popular discourse around the referendum, but absolutely not a design thing. Having given that more thought, and if we had been a bit quicker and smarter, we might have acquired the actual ballot paper, because that was an incredible piece of economy of design. The way the words were chosen, which is not necessarily design in the terms of how we might understand it here, but it was also about how it was laid out on the page. That was the object that we should have acquired. Um, there are lots of objects that have been suggested that, to my mind, don't quite make it, like Malala Yousef's school uniform on the day that she was shot. That was um, put on display in the Nobel Centre um, when she was nominated or even received the award. For me, that was an object of material culture or historical significance. In no way was the design of that thing the lead interest. Um, but that digital design, I mean, we've had a digital department now at the museum for three years. And so it's one of those things that we are skilling up on. Um, I'm really happy and keen to be given and suggested objects of that nature, because the more that I have to work with, the more we can bring about change in the institution. And that's one of the things that's very, very important, and maybe I didn't emphasize enough with rapid response. We are fully aware that as curators today, we are not going to be the experts on everything and all things. And rapid response is about that conversation. It's about saying, think about the world, but also help us to think about the world with you and through you. And so we, offer, we want people to come and suggest objects to us. So it's about inviting in expertise in all terms. And the others, I mean, we're also working on a video games exhibition, which is the beginnings of a longer term engagement with the design narrative that is so important within gaming and video games. And there is a brilliant set of communities that are always going to be better than us as an institution in documenting, preserving, maintaining video games. And I think as an institution, we need to embrace a more digital attitude, be more open, more sharing, uh, more collaborative. And that in many ways goes against what lots of institutions' historical approach has been. And if you just think about images and access and rights to images or scholarship. You know, it's about retention as opposed to sharing. And that shift is happening and it has to happen in terms of collecting, exhibiting, etc. Um, History of Computing Museum in Bletchley Park, uh, there's a reconstruction of the Colossus. It, must have, it took them about 10 years to reconstruct it. It had to be reconstructed because uh, they were all uh, smashed up after the war. But very, very important, which is because that's what the code breaking that was done against the Germans. And then yesterday, we were at the Computer History Museum here, where they've got an IBM 1401. A uh, very, very important computer of its time. It's, you know, it's, it's your 60s image of a computer with all the waves. And they actually found a complete one. Um, and it took... Um, the volunteers there 17 years uh, to reconstruct it. It works. It wasn't working yesterday, but apparently it does work. I was wondering, these are two sort of massive enterprises. 
you know, spending almost 20 years to get an IBM 1401 to work again, a very important 60-year-old computer, or reconstructing the key computer that helped us win the Second World War. I mean, do you think there's a sense of enterprises? The making things of history work again. And, and in both those cases, because they're digital devices, you know, it isn't just a few people spend, spend a year doing it. I mean, they had about 30 people uh, working for 17 years. So they can do and it. you could liken it to the Flying Scotsman, which is one of our greatest steam engines, having just been brought back into service and it taking a great deal of time and a great deal of funds. I'm going to slightly skirt your question and say my endeavour working in the contemporary is to try and avoid that happening in the future. Um, and that's the approach that I have. I think in terms of digital objects and making ones of the past work again, I think it's interesting. But if I had to place my, my efforts, I would place them elsewhere. Um, I think there is born digital artwork. There are very many objects in collections where you cannot understand the artwork without the function of these period pieces. And I think that's where you will often find the greatest endeavor to make those things work again. Um, and I think, again, it's about the sharing and exchanging of expertise that might be the best thing. How many of those IBM computers we need to bring back into service across the globe would be another one of those questions. All right, let's thank our speaker one more time.